Good evening, and welcome to our SpedNet webinar, Navigating Conversations, Skill Building, Educational Relevance, and Family Engagement with Peggy Budd and Tamara Jacobson. We're pleased to have you joining us. I'm Jennifer Bernheim, your moderator for tonight's webinar. I'm the founder of Right to Read Advocacy and the co-vice president for SpedNet. Just a few words about SpedNet. SpedNet was created 25 years ago as a nonprofit with the mission to educate and empower parents of students with special needs to become their children's best advocates. In addition to our webinars, presentations, and support group, we have a terrific and easily accessible website with videos of all of our presentations and webinars sorted by topic and speaker, as well as articles and related materials. We have published an excellent interactive guide to special services, bringing knowledge to the table, how to be an effective advocate for your child. Joining us tonight from SpedNet board, our co-founder and president, Eve Kessler. You want to give a wave, Eve? All right. We're here because of Eve. And um, my co-vice president, Robin Spath, is on as well. If you find our information tonight uh, helpful and supportive, please feel free to donate directly to SpedNet. As I mentioned, we're a nonprofit, and your donations go directly towards programming. Tonight's webinar is presented in partnership with the Wilton Public Schools and also Weston Parents for Special Education Progress. The mission of Weston Parents for Special Education Progress is to promote better outcomes for Weston's special education students through inclusivity, education, and collaboration. Now, before I introduce our speakers, I wanted to share a few ground rules. Please be mindful that this is an open forum and the presentation is being recorded, so we cannot guarantee confidentiality. You may not want to reveal any private information in your questions. This webinar recording will be sent out to all of you by email and posted on our website and YouTube channel. And our guests will take questions through the talk and you are able to type your questions in the Q&A, not the chat. Any information provided in this presentation is for general information purposes only and is not intended to be legal or therapeutic advice. Now I'm excited to introduce our speakers. Peggy Budd. Peggy is a licensed speech language pathologist and school administrator with 30 plus years experience in public education and the special education realm, much of it in Westport. She founded Speaking Skillfully to provide consultation services to families of children with special needs and to help business professionals bridge the gap of communication. Peggy advises families on how to successfully advocate for their child by having data-driven conversations and building strong homeschool partnerships. She provides professional development opportunities to educators, teaching them how to effectively communicate with parents, write strong educational plans, and differentiate their instruction to address the needs of students. Peggy has spoken at national conferences, women's summits, rotary clubs, libraries, and more. She serves on the board of directors for Bridge Academy, a charter school in Bridgeport, an earth place in Westport. She holds a BS from Indiana University, as well as an MS and six-year certificate in educational leadership from Southern Connecticut State University. Her motto is, it's more than what you say, it's how you say it. Our second speaker, Tamira Jacobson. Tamira has more than 30 years of experience advocating for children and has taught English as a second language, theater arts, history, public speaking, and language arts. She served as the head of curriculum and instruction for five years and as supervisor. She holds lifetime and praxis certificates in administration and supervision, K-12, ESL bilingual education, dual education, K-12, history, K-12, communication arts, K-12, early childhood education, pre-K-3, and elementary education, K-6. through Tamira is currently the executive director of East Coast Educational Consulting, LLC, and has conducted hundreds of workshops for teachers, teachers' aides, therapists, administrators, boards of directors, parent associations, and private community organizations on a wide variety of topics. Tamira holds a postgraduate certificate in administration supervision with a concentration in urban studies. Currently, she's a doctoral candidate in learning and organizational change. Tamira is the mother of three daughters, one of whom lives with severe, significant physical and cognitive developmental delays. Her daughter inspires her daily to make a difference in the educational landscape of her practice. In addition to their wealth of experience, Peggy and Samira partnered to co-author the book you see on screen, Navigating Special Education, The Power of Building Positive Parent-Educator Partnerships. 
And I'm grateful to be a, uh, that a mutual friend actually introduced Peggy and I and just happens to live in the same town, pretty ironic. Um, and when we met, I knew that we had to share this 5C model um, and key tips from their book with the SpedNet community because it's always helpful uh, for us to learn how to enhance those parent educator partnerships. So we're gonna dive in and start with an excerpt from the book and then an overview of their 5C model, some questions, and then we'll take questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Sure. Thank you. Um, so I guess, I, yeah, go to the, click on a couple of screens. You got it, I'm driving here. Okay, so now let's do Taylor's story. All right, let's start with Taylor's story. Give me one second there to bring it out. Meet Taylor. Taylor used to have a hard time in school and needed more help than other students to keep up with the curriculum. Taylor's parents weren't sure how to navigate the special education process. The school team was making recommendations about placement, programs, and services without considering their suggestions. Ineffective communication and lack of collaboration meant that meetings turned into heated arguments. After Taylor's parents and teachers read Navigating Special Education, they started to listen to each other and were able to communicate more effectively. Parents and educators now understood how to work collaboratively as partners with a shared vision. Everyone felt that their voices were heard during the IEP meetings and their data-driven perspectives were considered when developing the education plan. As a result, Taylor's academic success improved dramatically. If you want to build a trustworthy parent-educator partnership to ensure student success, visit navigatingspecialeducation.com to order your book today. It's a win-win for everyone. So I wanted to take a, a moment just to say that's an introduction to families and school districts about our journey of writing Navigating Special Education. And we know that so many families that we're talking to tonight have been through the, the path um, that we write about. And we wanted to start tonight with a short anecdote that Peggy and I wrote. It's based on a piece by Dr. Seuss and it's called Yesterday's Dream. And before uh, Peggy reads it, I wanted to say that as a mother of a, a daughter who is very special and has wonderful, unique attributes, um, and but also faces very severe challenges, this was a very important way to open our book. And I wanted to just share that um, as you go through this evening with us, both Peggy and I share personal connections with, um, with our own stories. And uh, we hope that you enjoy this piece. Thank you. Uh, we call this yesterday's dream because we know that as parents of special education students, we all have dreams. And so this is what we wrote. Dr. Seuss said, oh, the places you'll go. And yes, some of these places will be fun and exciting, and some will be difficult to navigate, and other places we'd rather not go. But life doesn't always give us choices. So instead of focusing on what you didn't get, celebrate what you got. Make lemonade out of lemons and enjoy drinking it down to the very last drop. As soon as a family knows they're going to have a baby, they begin to formulate their hopes and dreams for their soon-to-be child and themselves. They make plans, they decorate the room, even decide where the child will go to college. Many parents envision momentous occasions, birthdays, bar mitzvahs, sweet 16s, proms and weddings, and even the birth of their first grandchild. Some families decide the child's career. They'll be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher. Others assume their child will take over their family's business or follow in their footsteps. Many parents are lucky enough to have children who will fulfill their hopes and dreams, while others will have to change yesterday's dream. When either at birth or early childhood, or even during teenage years, a child is medically identified as having a disability, parents are left devastated. Their child 
disability, whether mild or profound, will change the trajectory of their life and their family's path. Some students develop illnesses as children while others develop disabilities over time. In all cases, the family and the child's journey changes because of this diagnosis. Yesterday's dream is no more possible. What does that mean? It means that parents' original plans for the momentous occasions and career choice will be different. When parents are faced with an unexpected diagnosis at any time throughout life, what could have been, this is normal. It takes a paradigm shift on the part of the whole family to embrace the new vision. There are many resources and opportunities to help families. From the moment parents, students, and educators join the child's journey called special education, they'll find challenges and many other things simple and beautiful. There will be ups and downs, and the family travels this path from childhood to adulthood. Embracing a new shared vision requires perseverance and a little grit, but the result is then a positive journey filled with new hopes and successes, and the entire family and the exceptional child will be the best that they can be. And we hope that you enjoyed that, and I'm sure it touched some of you um, as you- well, With that, with yesterday's dream, we want you to know that for some families, it is the loss of a dream. And just like any loss, it is normal for a family to grieve. Parents go through a process of grieving and it's not necessarily linear. So here are some of the stages of acceptance and also um, going along on that journey. They go through denial. Families might go through anger. Families go through bargaining. Families go through depression. And then we've seen many, many families go through a wonderful acceptance. And that's very typical uh, after they have their diagnosis. So with that, we're going to arm you this evening with some wonderful tools on how to take this life's journey. Peggy? Okay, so we're going to begin with um, Tamara and I, this is a original framework that we created based on all of our conversations and experiences as educators and administrators, and as a way we thought uh, parents and educators could come together to form a partnership. The model is circular, and it starts with conversations. I'm I'm gonna begin by talking to you about the elements of conversations. We believe that to have good conversations, it means that we have to have dialogues, not monologues. And I'm sure many of you have spent many times at meetings feeling like people were giving dialogues. Those are not conversations. And so our model really talks about digging deep and having asking lots of questions. These conversations must be data-driven, they must use active listening, and you must develop empathy, an understanding of each other's perspective. This evidence that you bring will help the conversations become child-centered, and your perspective taking will help you understand that each of you, it doesn't mean that you agree, but that you have to understand the other person's perspective and where they're coming from in order to have conversations and be ready for next, Tamara? So like Peggy said, our conceptual framework is circular. And what that means is we hope that in the circle, when you get to a consensus, um, that is the goal. But many, many times as you're building a partnership, you need to go back. And so we're talking about stage two and three here, which is collaboration and cooperation. So after um, Peggy so eloquently discussed uh, conversations, and as you're having the conversation, we want you to think about being collaborative and cooperative. And we're, I'm just for tonight's sake, I'm going to put those together in the book, We Divide Them. 
So collaboration is really when two or more people work together in a group, like in an IEP meeting, and they work together for the common goal, which in this case is the student or the child's voice and what's best the plan for the child. As long as the child stays in the center of that conversation, you're going to be able to work collaboratively and you're going to put together some of these shared ideas. And when you're cooperating, that's when the people around the table, normally two or more, support each other's goals. So they've listened to one another. They've heard their individual idea, their individual goals, and they bring their own expertise, their own cultural responsiveness to that conversation and their own uh, experiences with the child. So it's understanding and supporting the person and the experiences that the person um, has had with the child uh, that we're talking about. And I'll let Peggy talk about number three in the cyclical mo circular model. Conference. Actually, number, number four, because we oh. did two together. That's okay. Um, compromise. Now, we know that uh, there's going to be bumps in the road. This sounds idyllic, and we hope that they everything moves along. You have conversations, collaborate, cooperate, and you reach consensus. But we know that that doesn't always happen. And so what do you do? That's really where the problem becomes. And compromise. I'm sure some of you are sitting there and saying, oh, yes, that's what she means. We're going to have to give in and give up some things. Well, yeah, that is a form of compromise. We envision because of the conversations, collaboration and cooperation, that compromise can be something bigger and better. And that is through these conversations, we hope that each person um, who has ideas and they're not agreeing with the other can together listen, understand the perspective and look at the key points which are going to meet the child's needs. And it's going to be based on your shared vision, which is so crucial. And so what will happen if you really do this model? you will come up with a way of almost melding these ideas together and creating something that neither one of you thought about. As a parent, you wanted something, but when you start doing it, you're gonna end up with something better. And the school district has a plan, but all of a sudden, when we do all this together, this is even better and the child will do even be more successful. And so, of course, when this happens, then we can reach consensus. Uh, and as Tamara said, it's a circular model. So if you still can't come up with a compromise and you're still not agreeing, we say go back and yeah. you that means you have to have more conversations, dig deeper. And our book talks a lot about how to have good conversations and how to be an active listener. And this is so important. Tamara, yeah. do you want to add anything else that I forgot? Right. And so along with consensus, you will hopefully have a signed IEP at the end of the annual IEP and a review. And you will also hopefully have a program placement and service that everybody can agree upon and that you feel comfortable with. However, we say it's very important to stay on um, your child, or if you're a teacher, stay on the progress and continue seeing that they're always making progress. And with that, we know how a child can be evaluated for making progress, and that is the importance of data. So I'll introduce the first slide, and Jen, if you can just hit yep, one at a time. Why is data so important? And how does that mix with our 5C model of communication? Well, if everybody comes armed to a conversation, it's very, very hard to dispute facts. Facts help to install trust. And so we want you to think about data um, as a way to back up your concerns, to back up your thoughts about what's going on at the school if you're a parent. And if you're a teacher, this should back up what you are going to say to the family. 
recommendations using concrete evidence. So test scores, math scores. Okay, the next one. Be objective. So you're going to use objective tools. Um, if somebody looks at the tools that you used to collect data and saw that you put your slant on it, they're not going to trust the data. Okay, it's not going to be reliable. It's not going to have validity. So it's very important that it's objective in your decision making. And it's, again, very difficult to argue when somebody is showing you or uh, presenting data. And we're going to talk about what that looks like. Peggy? No, there's one more. Oh, sorry. Um, and reliable data, uh, like I said, builds trust. So that's what we're trying to do is build trust. Okay. And types of data. There are lots of different ways to collect data. Both parents and educators can use these ways to collect data. Portfolios. Some teachers collect portfolios of their students and they share them at um, IEP meetings or they share them at parent conferences. Parents, you too should be collecting portfolios, keeping papers and information to show and your child's progress. Or if you have concerns that your child is not making progress, keeping papers that show that the same errors are happening or the same examples is one way to um, collect data. Another way is recordings. Video recordings, um, we're doing less audio, I think, today than video. And of course, we all have those um, phones and we can easily record things. And that is so important. And it's so powerful and can send a really powerful message. Again, as Tamara said, it's hard to argue with facts. If you have a video of your child struggling to read a book and you bring that book and they see him struggling, they can't argue, well, of course, he can really read it. The same is true if the teacher with permission, you know, that she could have videoed your child, shows you your child reading the book, that becomes, wow, they really can read it. They're just not reading it for me. So recordings are powerful. Next are checklists. Uh, in our book, we have a plethora of examples of checklists that you can collect for behavior and um, academics and all kinds of things. So you have a way to document and we've given you the templates for that. And then there are logs. And one of the most important logs that I think parents need to keep are phone logs. Every time you talk to a teacher um, or, and if you text, keep a log of your communication. Those are really important. And last of all, anecdotal data. Uh, keep a little diary or a little journal of your concerns and always make sure you date it so you tell what your concern or what the event is, you know, how your child struggled at a birthday party or had a meltdown um, coming off the bus. Keep this anecdotal data and then you can, again, share that. And if, if it's kept in that way, it becomes um, collectible and easy to uh, bring to a meeting or to use to discuss. And so the last, that's our, the last that's point a quick about, overview of data. And the, the last point about data is that all everything that Peggy went over, they are considered legal documents if you have to move through due process. So we just wanted to emphasize, if you didn't know that, um, everything at, at some point in the due process can be used as a legal uh, document. I just wanted to bring up that point. Okay. So we hope you enjoyed that little overview, Jennifer. Yeah, absolutely. I'd just like a follow-up question there, if you don't mind. How do you suggest that parents actually organize this data, right? Because we often become overwhelmed with volumes of IEPs or, you know, collecting logs or checklists. What do you recommend for organizing this data? Peggy, do you mind? I was going to say, one of the things that is really important is to keep a binder uh, and with dividers and keep all that information. And it's not just when, when we're talking about information, data, as Tamara says, is everything. So uh, we in that portfolio, you also not only want to keep, let's say, written work or um, your checklists, uh, but you also want to keep 
teacher cor a correspondence between home and school emails. You want to keep the IEP must be in that. And you also want to keep a record of the invitations you got and any other information, any kind of progress reports, report cards. And we suggest that you keep them for you keep them as years. So you have all this data for the 2023-24 school year, and then um, either put get a new portfolio, don't get rid of that data because you may need it to substantiate a concern or to uh, that, that your child is not making the progress you wanted and now you have evidence, uh, but, but you, so you keep it, but in your current portfolio that um, collection, you're gonna be bringing up, up the current year because otherwise you'd be coming in to meetings with boxes. If you just have one, uh, binder, it's easy to walk into an IEP meeting with And that. I just want to add, um, Jennifer, because you asked a very good point, how do you set it up? In the back of our book, Navigating Special Education, in our appendix, we truly have already um, set it up for you. So it was like date, time, the checklist, the concern, the location that the concern occurs, um, the intervention that you tried, whether you're a parent and or a teacher, and whether it worked. So you don't have to recreate this wheel. We, we've given you many, many templates in that, it, again, it's for academics, behavior, physical, emotional, and social. So it's there, um, but we appreciate the follow-up question. Right. And in the book, in addition to it, there's a list of all the documents you should keep. And that would be, and it's also in our book, as well as we explain why you why you should keep them and what you would do with them. Because you don't want to just say, oh, this is another piece of paper. And why do I have to keep it? And I do suggest that be, um, if everything you get is electronic, either you keep it an electronic file folder um, and label it the school year and you have it in there or you print it up and different people have different styles and what's comfortable for one person is not for another. So I'm not going to say print everything or keep it electronically, but you do want to. And if you keep an electronic file, you may want to scan work and then you can put all that into the same file because it's really important. I think to keep everything together for the year. Because if you're going, when you come to a meeting, if you're going in all different places, it's confusing and harder to um, access it. It's 7.30. So at this time, um, Jennifer, because it's it's 7.30 and I want us to stay on target. You can, um, you can finish we can, the- um, We can start with um, questions whenever you are ready. Sounds good. So let's back up for a minute. Um, thank you for providing the overview of the book, but could you actually share with us how you met and why you even start decided to write the book? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna start. Um, it's a very very interesting story actually. Um, Peggy and I were I guess we were very early for our time. We were both on LinkedIn uh, over 12 years ago, and we were responding to the same question. So there was something on LinkedIn and the other educators were a bit negative and were like, oh, they're, you know, it's not going to end well. And both Peggy and I, we didn't know each other. We responded to this LinkedIn post in a very positive way and in a very similar way. And from then on, Peggy sort of contacted me and we realized that our con concepts of education were very similar and that it was a little bit more positive and, and progressive and, and forward moving than maybe some of the other comments that we had read. So we formed a relationship. Um, interesting fact, I live in New Jersey. Peggy lives in Connecticut. Um, and so we live about an hour and 20 minutes from one another. And for the first five years that Peggy and I had a relationship, we would meet in Westchester, New York, which was the halfway meeting point, And we would start telling stories. She was an administrator. I was an administrator. I was a parent. She was a grandparent of, of um, kids with uh, learning issues. And so we would have these wonderful lunches. And at one of the lunches, I said, Peggy, we have 
so much information here and just these amazing yeah. case studies, these amazing yeah. stories. We have to write this in a book. And the other part of our book are a lot of case stories and they're all real. They're all based on true stories um, with the names changed. So we did that for a while. And unfortunately, I had to, um, I wasn't able to continue at that pace. And so for a while we lost touch and Peggy, I'll let you take it from COVID. <laughs> right, so I guess we could call in our case, COVID had a silver lining. All of a sudden now, one, we were home and two, technology had grown. So now we had Zoom, we could get on Zoom every day. We also were never running or going anywhere. So whatever time of the day we could work around our schedules and we had Google Docs. So we, we reconnected, not that we hadn't kept in touch but we started talking to each other you know, sometimes multiple times a day, forget multiple times a week. And we start. we said, okay, let's write the book. The exciting part about it was the book that we had started and the book we wrote are not the same, meaning that the book we started was going to be helping parents be able to form partnerships. And what we realized was a partnership is two people or two groups. And so we said, mm, we can't just do that. So we wrote the book saying, Educators, this is what you need to do. And parents, this is what you need to do to form a partnership and to work as a as partners, not just sitting on that IEP team and just feeling like you're not really a part of the conversation. And so that's that's how it came. That's and how it came about. And we have a wonderful publisher and uh, we've been speaking nationally for over a year now. So thank you. We're glad that you have met and brought us uh, this valuable framework because it's certainly needed, as you know, when you sit at the IEP table, it's always helpful to have some uh, extra extra tips to get you through those challenging conversations. Um, so with your 5C model, how have you used this framework when you're working together and you know developing your own partnership? So I'm, I'm going to uh, say a little something. Peggy and I are different ages. And uh, Peggy's a grandmother, I'm a mother, and we enjoy that, but we have different skill sets. And just like if you were a parent at an IP meeting and you were a principal or a case manager or a teacher at an IP meeting, you're coming with different perspectives. And while Peggy and I really have very similar perspectives in the long run, we have very different life lived experiences. So what we did is we actually lived our 5C model. We uh, hash it out. Um, we know how to start and have a conversation. We try and implement our active listening skills. We put uh, perspective into everything we say to one another. We give each other eye contact and our body and our tone is very important in that conversation with active listening. So we give respect to one another, even though we don't always agree. And we will talk and talk until we get to not Peggy's opinion and not my opinion, but to a shared vision as to what we think would be best practice. So we go through the model with collaboration and cooperation, and then we compromise. And a lot of times we do go back. We don't get to agreeing. And it could take you know a week to two weeks to write one page in a book because we've used our model, but it's worth it in the end. Right. And what I'd like to add is that we talk about a shared vision and what we also found is when you're really working as partners, what you do is you almost develop a third voice. And what we found, and we weren't quite aware of it until we saw the whole manuscript come together, but we followed this process and all of a sudden we're reading this manuscript and we're looking at this book. And what we're realizing is that it's not my voice. Those, that's not how I would be writing. And it's not Tamara's voice. It's a new voice. It's a third voice that we created. And that's what a partnership is. You're, you're coming together and becoming partners and creating this new vision. Okay, so I'm sorry. I just technically, Peggy, I think if you lower your volume, 
Um, there's a really bad echo. I'm not sure if it's coming from Jennifer or if everyone hits mute um, and just make sure that they mute each other when they're not speaking. But there's a there was a large echo that I heard when Peggy was speaking. I just want to make sure everyone can hear us clearly. Thank you. Great. Um, and that 5C model from what you've just exhibited can really be applied to any situation or conversation life. So I, I really appreciate that practical everyday example. I think I need to try that in my house with teenagers, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Good, new tool for me. Um, I wanna dive into a couple of um, parts of your book that I really enjoyed. And I, and I thought it was really fascinating that you started your book with this parent educator self-reflection questionnaire. So you did your pre and post questionnaire in the book. What what brought that on? So I'll I'll just uh, take the beginning of it and Peggy can um, chime on. So I'm very into teaching about data. Um, I am a doctoral candidate and uh, done a, a, a huge amount of research. And you know when you're looking at evidence based information, you want a pre and a post tool. Right. And so you, it's kind of like a Likert scale. Um, and so, I, you know, I think we had a conversation and I said to Peggy, I just want to know, like, do, do they know any of this already? And if you do, if you're parents and you know some of it, let's get let's get it written down. Let's let's have them have an assess a self-assessment and it will reflect on best practices for concepts that we want them to focus on. So just by taking the self-reflection, you're going to focus on the areas that we think are most important. And then we repeat it at the end of the book. And we want to know that as educators, we've done our job and you should be able to feel confident that you've come away with many, many tools from the book. So that's a little bit. And Peggy, you can add any other insight to that? I then mute. Uh I agree. And I think that we as educators and as administrators, the importance of self-reflection was really key to this because, and, and also we felt that if somebody's reading this book and we're hoping that people read the book and pass it along to others and encourage others, well, the best way to do it is when you finish reading the book and you go through and do this checklist again, you go, wow, I learned all this stuff. Things have changed. Well, of course it's a good book. Um, and if you, uh, otherwise you, you may, might not really be aware of how the impact it had. So thank you, Jen, for even saying that it was helpful where it accomplished what we wanted. It gave people a chance to think. And we're hoping that as it goes at the end, how people view special education in the IEP process, which at the beginning, I'm sure is very intimidating. And hopefully, which that first question, you know, how do you see it? Is it comfortable, intimidating or something else? Hopefully at the end, you say, well, it's no longer intimidating. I'm, you know, it's never going to be comfortable to be in these meetings, but maybe that isn't the best term, but it's definitely not going to be intimidating. You're going to feel that now you're empowered. And that's Thank you, Peggy. what we're looking for. I just want to add to what Peggy said. Uh, in, in Peggy and I's experience as educational experts and educational consultants, the number one word that comes up from the parent's perspective is anxiety. Anxiety being fearful. Okay, so I think part of the reason that we wrote the book was to try and, you know, bring a lot of tools to both to both uh, all members of the IP team and to work cooperatively. And so the self-reflection was just another tool in that. Great, thank you. And actually speaking about anxiety, I think your other concept um, of the pre-meeting is also probably to minimize anxiety as well. So if you could share a bit more about the pre-meeting and how you've seen that take place. We started thinking about uh, parents and, and uh, as Tamara said, their anxiety, their um, walking into a room for the first time where they're, there you are, the parent, whether you're the parent or the parents coming into the room. And there might be at an IEP meeting, there may be six, eight, 10 people in the building that can be overwhelming. And if you don't understand the process, we've added and we've ratcheted the anxiety up again. And if you don't understand the language that's being used, the jargon, you've ratcheted it up again. 
So we felt that, um, and it's this is our unique idea, that if you had a pre-meeting where a parent or parents and either the administrator or the case manager could just spend a little bit of time we talk about 30 minutes and there's really two purposes. One, just to get to know that person so that you build that relationship. Partnerships have to start by building relationships. And then once you have that, which would mean some conversation, which is not about school, but just about yourself, your child, just really comfortable. And then giving the parents some tools, explaining to them why they've gotten their procedural safeguards, which can be overwhelming and intimidating because of the legalese, to tell them what's going to happen when they go to this meeting um, and how they're going to be working together. And then we feel that if that happens, and if it happens not just the first IEP meeting, but on consistent ones, if there's that short meeting, parents are going to build that bond with this person and they're going to feel that they have a friend in the room and they're going to feel that they have a partner and they're going to be it's going to be less hopefully intimidating and they're going to be able to work together so we feel that it can reduce anxiety and hopefully answer questions so that parents and educators come to the meeting more prepared on to the the vision that everybody has and how to work collaboratively and Tamara, also, do you want to add some, something also, um, I think the brainchild of the pre-meeting was because, like Peggy said, if you don't understand the language, if you're nervous, if you are just starting the process, and even if you've been in the process, sometimes the administration changes or the members of the IEP team change, as uh, you know, Jen, I guess you're, you've acknowledged. And one of the things about true leadership transformative leadership, what we expect from our administration and the kind of leaders that both Peggy and I were is that, and I've had a lot of talks with administrators that worry about, I don't have time for this. How am I going to meet with all the families and see them before the IP? We expect you to carve out 15 to 20 minutes, 30 would be ideal to find the time to introduce a new family to this process. It's important. And one of the things that is very unique to this meeting is that, yes, we don't want the administration to talk to the families just about special education. We want to find out what do you, you know, what do you guys do at home? What's fun? What do you do on the weekends? What does your child really enjoy? And keep the questions in a way where you meet somebody new and you have to come up with those icebreakers. And just by having that talk, the parents become friendlier with the administration. It breaks down those walls and the administrators see the family in a little bit of a different light. They get some kind of context to that family. Right. Excellent idea. Hopefully our administrators will will enact that. Thank you. <laughs> Good suggestions. Um, also in preparing for um, an IEP meeting, you mentioned a parent student input, input statement. If you could maybe talk about the value of that, I think it probably helps us to stay child focused. Um, and you had some great conversation starters uh, in the book. So if you wanted to share a few of those, that'd be great. Sure. Well, I think what we were referring to in when we wrote this is on the IEP, there's a section called parent um, student input. And that's really what we're referring to. And we were talking about the fact that it's important for parents to make sure that they have their voice at the meeting. It's also important for parents to be prepared and to think that's why we put those sentence starters in those uh, question, not questions in so that parents will think, well, what am I, because otherwise, well, what am I going to say? And again, we said they're anxious, they're nervous, they're intimidated, they feel maybe that they don't have as much to bring. So we let them know, okay, what do you think your child's strengths are? What are your concerns um, at home? Uh, what do you think your child- how do you work with my child in the classroom? So those how, where, what, when, when does my child get anxious in your class? How often do they need a break? Um, all of those questions kind of came up in our thought process for sentence starters. And that's real easy to grab onto if you're a family member, the how, where, when, why, and what. But in terms of the student 
reflection and having that prepared, Peggy? Yeah, so not only should the parent come with, right. and, and they don't send it ahead of time, but I want them to have written it out, thought it out, rather than uh, wing it, because then you're nervous. If you've thought it out and you've written out your, and you can come with notes. These are the three things I want to say, and it's not a long speech. It's just some things. How have you seen your child doing since the last meeting or new concerns? It, every time it can be different. It's also a student input. And if a student is old enough to attend an IEP meeting, they should. We encourage, as an as a consultant, I work with students many times, encouraging them and empowering them to give a statement, to tell what it is that they need or why they think they need something. And I mean, there's a story in the book about a student who, you know, wanted something and the parents did not think he was going to get it. And yet, because I empower, and I actually worked with him, I empowered him to feel like, okay, you need to speak up. And when he did, all of a sudden, wow, he got what he needed when he explained why. So I want students to feel, I had a little, I had a high school student once who said to, said to me, I can't speak because I will cry. And I said, if you're that passionate and you have that much of a need that you want, you need to do it. And if you cry, it's okay. And she did get teary-eyed. We practiced. She got teary-eyed. But she, they knew that what she was saying and her concerns were authentic. And you know what? It affected the whole team. And it moved them to address things that they weren't doing and to tr find a, a, a level of trust that they didn't have because they saw her authenticity. So that's all very and important. I want to I just end with this. Uh, about this topic of, of writing down in advance um, some talking points or having the authenticity statement from the student if they're if it's possible. Um, one of the things Peggy and I also talked about when writing the book was how impactful the other parent or primary caregiver's voice is. So if you're, uh, let's say you're the mom and you always go to the IEP meetings, we encourage different voices from the family to speak up. It is amazing that sometimes the same request coming from the student, like Peggy said, or and or coming from a primary caregiver, a grandparent and or a spouse, they, that can be very powerful too. So just thinking about those dynamics can truthfully help in your impact statements. And I, I wanna move on from there, but I wanted to end with that. Thank you, those are all good, helpful um, points and to really think about what you want to say and contribute well in advance, right? Like you said, having your three points to go into the meeting with or for helping the student prepare as well. So thank you. Um, in your book, you also reference the idea of, you know, the meeting minutes and the meeting summary. And I just wanted to dive in and see, is that the responsibility of the district or the parent? Um, and also in talking about, you know, coming to consensus, it doesn't always happen. Like, how does that maybe meeting summary help if there is a disagreement? Uh, well, first of all, the meeting summary, it's not the parent's responsibility. The, the administrator who is uh, running that meeting will be taking the minutes and writing up the meeting summary. It is the the parents should one, hopefully read through that summary when they get the IEP and make sure that what's there is accurate and it does reflect what happened. Um, as an administrator, one of the things that would happen is parents would say, but I also said this, and I would remind them that this was a summary. This wasn't a transcript of the meeting. So therefore, I, you know, it hopefully highlighted the key points. Okay, but to that, to that point, um, if the trust is not built yet, I highly recommend, and this is the way that you do it. I highly recommend having the meeting recorded, um, but 
in many states, you have to give 24 hour notice to have the meeting recorded. And it's normally done by both the family and the school district. And that's perfectly okay. So you would send a note the night before and just say, I'm just letting you know that we're going to record the meeting today and I'll be utilizing my phone. And that gives the district time to say, okay, and we're gonna record the meeting as well. It's it's sort of a hard a hard thing because you want to go in trying to to be fair and you don't want to put anybody off. On the other hand, you do want to protect yourself as well. And when it comes to the minutes, um, my families don't usually write their own minutes. You can certainly take notes. I know Peggy and I talked about this question before, and you know I know Peggy feels that pa families should take their own notes and do their due diligence. Um, I would rather you just be in the moment and have the conversations. And when you're recording, it's kind of uh, easier that way. Uh, and I don't recommend ever recording at a first meeting. I'm talking that if you already are at a, a point in time where maybe communication has been difficult and you've gone through the circular model many, many times. Um, but that's kind of how we feel uh, about minute taking. And I would just like to add that uh, that being said, at the end of a meeting, I like to encourage families to send a follow-up note, um, email, um, one always saying thank you, thank you, you know, for your concerns, for for your help, whatever. And then if they if they, they to confirm, so if there were questions, these are the three things. This is before they ever get the IEP, because this way it will almost ensure that if there was a question that this is in the minutes. You know, these are the three things that we were still, um, you know, not in agreement with. This is the two things that we did agree to and we're really excited about. Um, and, you know, and these are concerns that we never got to discuss. So now it's all it's writing. writing very in a very simple positive way not a rant almost like a bullet point one one line sentences and you know and thank you and and i look forward to continuing to have this conversation we i expect it very positive it but it also that follow up note um lets everyone know and it could be i'm really excited these are the three things we agreed to looking forward to things happening now if they said they agreed to it and then didn't you know, aren't getting ready to implement it, they're going to see, wow, I just agreed to this. We've got to get this going. So that will, uh, I have found that that saves problems that, you know, may almost inadvertently happen without even intentionality. Great. Thank you. That's helpful. And I just want to let our attendees know that we have about less than five minutes left. So they're more than welcome to put their questions um, in the chat. And uh, one more question I'd like to ask, because you just touched upon uh, this big word of trust with, with school districts. And really, we know it's a cornerstone of these parent uh, school educator partnerships. And how do you suggest um, parents uh, rebuild trust if they feel that there is a breakdown uh, within their, their communication and, and their relationships in their child's school district? So, you know, in our book, we try to lay out um, as many ways to to work on relationship building, right? And so this new buzzword going around uh, in 2024, parent engagement, family engagement. And that's like the new buzz for this year. And, and that is very important. And how do you engage somebody if you don't trust them? And so, or if you haven't put in the time and put in the work, thus the pre-meetings, thus the 5C model, thus, you know, trying to get to know each other. These are just simple communication um, skills. And we need to bring that more into education for family engagement. But in terms of the real trust, I think when I teach data, when I teach about bringing your data, your with, with validity and reliability and efficacy, that goes so far in building trust because once the parents have seen for themselves or look at the scores and, and there's there was no denying it, um, it, it goes a long way. And once the, the teachers are like, well, we don't see this at school, there's no problems. But then 
the parents had videotaped it and they've seen it and you shut the lights and you're showing this video. Well, that goes a really long way. What they said happened actually occurred. And so you would be amazed and we can't emphasize enough that the power of doubt data builds the trust between the two parties. Right. And I'd like to add that two other factors that are important that building trust is that demonstration of being an active listener. Uh, because if you're just listening to respond and keep getting your ideas across and not really building on what the other person has said and having a conversation. So when you really say, I hear you and I understand this is what you're saying and understanding the other person's perspective, perspective taking also helps to build trust. And we have to remember too often people think if I understand somebody's perspective, I've agreed with them. And that's not what perspective taking means. It means that I understand where you're coming from and I want you to understand where I'm coming from. And that's the way to build a partnership. And that's the way to build trust that we have to understand each other. And then we can have more meaningful conversations and hopefully come up with what we're calling a compromise, a way to come up with a creative way to take everybody's ideas and build something that is the biggest and best for the child. And lastly, um, words do shut down the conversation. Peggy and I do a whole clinic on this. What words to avoid? Try and avoid no. Try and avoid shouldn't. Try and avoid won't. Try, try and avoid, you know, can't. Can't is the one of the worst. And, and, the, and the other one is remember never to say yes, but. but. That shuts down the conversation because then you so, work so if, we, if you're aware of those words, you are on your way to building trust if you avoid the negative words, but it is 758. And I know that you um, have some last minute things. Yeah, for sure. I know. I wish we had uh, some more time. I have lots more questions, but that's okay. This was, a we, would be, we would be more than happy to come back on another occasion as well. Um, I've heard, listened to some of your other talks and I was hoping we get to your story, Tamara, where you illustrated so beautifully for your child's school district um, through recording, you know, what, what, what you ne needed at the time. So uh, hopefully we can come back to that story. Um, There's a question in the Q&A. Uh, I think it's a comment. Uh, shall I read it? The thank you. Just sure. Or am I missing it? How do you suggest presenting this book and philosophy to the current school team? It's a great question. We get that all the time. Uh, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I suggest that um, every school has a parent-teacher association and they have a special needs um, association, typically in every school district. So we call it SPED by us. You, you have the name of your own. Um, I suggest uh, calling up your administrator, asking to have a quick meeting, taking the book, and um, just presenting the book and saying, I was at this workshop, it, you know, it was so important, it was so meaningful, I would love it, take a look at it, maybe your staff could read it, maybe you can have these gals do some workshops with your staff, um, and change the mindset, but, it's you, you know, there's so, there's so many good things in here, so just Take the initiative to pick up the phone um, and, and make a call to your administration or send an email with a picture of the book and um, explain, you know, that that you found that there was a lot of good value in the book. Right. And our on the bottom of the screen has been our website. There's a lot of these blogs, uh, the, the video that we showed, which kind of highlights uh, what happens is on our website. So um you know, sending them to the website to learn more about us and about the book and some of the ideas, because it's really about having those conversations and encouraging. And it's about, we can't build trust and we can't have partnerships if both, if unless parents and teachers both want to embrace the 5C model and work together. It's not going to happen. It's not a one-sided process. We just wanted to thank everybody. Um, I know that, that this was a full hour you gave up of your time. And, uh, you know, it's very meaningful to myself and to my partner, Peggy. 
that we were able to come on and share some of these new concepts. Uh, we are really trying to change the landscape of education in our little way. And if you know you can help by take you know get, purchasing a copy, you can get it on Amazon, on Slack, on our website, navigatingspecialeducation.com. And I would say it is free to read blogs. And Peggy and I are constantly posting. So little tidbits of information. They're there for you. So thank you so much for this evening. I really thank you. Love. Thank you, Jennifer and Eve, um, for inviting us and and hosting this. And for I guess Weston and Wilton, I hope that all of you uh, got value out of our conversation tonight. We're open. Please feel free to email us or reach out to us with questions. Where we wrote the book because. You know, we we know we can't change the world big, but maybe we can change at least a little bit and help some people um, have partnerships and help students be more successful without the adversarial anxiety that happens so often. And is there any way um, for us to take a quick picture, like a snapshot? Yeah. Would you like me to try that? Yeah, I would love yeah. that. Why don't you do it? One second there. Jennifer, is there a giveaway? Oh yeah, our giveaway. So we're, go we're going to um, announce the winners in the follow-up email tomorrow. So cool. um, Peggy and Tamir graciously uh, agreed to give away two copies of the book. So we'll announce the names uh, in the uh, follow-up email that will also have the recording link. And so two lucky attendees will have this guide, which will they'll, they'll find very beneficial. I love the checklist at the end, the sample communications, like it's just a wealth of information. So thank you both for, for taking the time. And thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thank yeah. you. Bye-bye.